from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. David M. Rubenstein. Thank you. So, thank you. So we are very uh, honored and privileged today to have one of the leading authors and scholars of the Revolutionary War period uh, in our country, uh, Joseph Ellis. Joseph Ellis is a person who actually grew up in Washington, went to Gonzaga High, went to William & Mary, all right, Gonzaga High grads, um, went to William & Mary, then got his PhD at Yale, and spoke, spent most of his academic career teaching at Mount Holyoke College, where he was the dean of the faculty at one point and endowed professor. He's also taught at Williams, at West Point, and at University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And on the side, when he hasn't been teaching, he's been writing best-selling books. Uh, among them are biographies of John Adams, George Washington, uh, Jeff Thomas Jefferson, this book on Thomas Jefferson, American Sphinx, uh, won the uh, National Book Award. And his book on the uh, Revolutionary Brothers, or the, the founding uh, brothers, uh, the Revolutionary Generation, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2001. Most recently, he has written a book that I actually have here, The Quartet, that has been for 10 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It's about what he would call the Second American Revolution, the revolution that began really in 1787, not 1776. So let's get into that. But before we do that, uh, thank you very much for coming, Dr. Ellis. Uh, why did you decide to focus your academic career on the Revolutionary War period? You could have picked so many different areas. What was it about this area that was interesting to you? <clears throat> yeah, I do seem obsessed, don't I? And um, um, well, they asked um, Willie Sutton back in the 50s, why do you rob banks, Willie? And Willie said, because that's where they keep the money. Right. And the late 18th century is where they keep the ideas. Okay. That's the wellspring, the Big Bang, the place where the values and institutions under which we continue to live as Americans were created, and in some sense, they are like our classics, what Tacitus and Plutarch or Herodotus were to the founders, the founders are to us. Okay, let's say that's true. Um, when did you come to this realization, in college or in graduate school, or when did you say to your family, guess what, I'm going to spend my entire career focusing on these uh, Revolutionary War founding fathers? I never said that. Okay. My wife says, why are you doing this? You know, like, or when I was writing about Jefferson, she said, you shouldn't write about Jefferson. You don't really like Jefferson. You're not like him. And I said, well, I have red hair. I went to William and Mary and um, a Virginian. Um, now, I don't think that... You don't say you're a descendant of him, though, right? No, <laughs> no. I'm not claiming to be one of the Jefferson descendants, but I think that the way historians work is you don't know what you're going to do when you start out. And um, I started out thinking I was going to be a southern historian. And, um, and it, things just evolved. And I think that the guy that converted me to the founders was Adams. Right. Once I got into the Adams papers, especially the family correspondence between John and Abigail, there was a universe there, a world that I found so fascinating that I wanted to keep living in it. Right. So what is so relevant about the Founding Fathers for people living in 2015? What is relevant? Um, <clears throat> well, some things are relevant that I wish were not relevant. I mean, like, there are members of the Supreme Court, led by Mr. Justice Scalia and Mr. Justice Thomas, who believe that the interpretation of the Constitution must depend on what they divine to be the original intent of the framers. I think that's a crazy idea that none of the framers would actually agree with. Um, it's ironic, but one of the only intentions they, the framers shared was the notion that their intentions should not be used in that way. Um, uh, but I think that they are the fixed objects, the founders, against which we do our political isometric exercises. Right. 
Well, let me ask you this. The founders, we have deified our founders a bit. Uh, Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Madison, mm. and so forth, Hamilton. Um, yeah, then, Hamilton's really big right now. He, he's, right, he's, he's got, got a play own, about He's got yeah. his own play and rap, and so forth. So, but one wonders, in most areas of, of human conduct, we have advanced. People are faster, they're better athletes, they might be smarter in technology. Why is it in statecraft or government we don't seem to have any more Washington, Adams, Jeffersons, Hamiltons. Where are these people? Are they hiding somewhere? Or they, <laughs> were these people so unique that it's just a once in a, in a lifetime kind of thing? I, I, I'm only re-asking your question. When, the, when I'm on book tour, I, use, I ask a question of the audience. It's called the Wilkes-Barre question. I say that the population of Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania currently is about twice the size of the population of white population of Virginia in 1776. But if we go down to the streets of Wilkes-Barre, we walk the streets and we look carefully, will we discover George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, George Mason, Patrick Henry, and John Marshall? And the, answer the answer is, is no. <laughs> and now the one answer is they're there in latent form, but you won't find them. And there's a kind of crisis theory of leadership, that leadership only comes into existence in times of great crisis. Um, now, the problem with that is we can think of a lot of great crises that don't produce great leaders. But while it's certainly impossible to argue that the late 18th century was a time when there was something special in the water back then, um, it was a, dis a crisis that managed to generate the most impressive group of political leaders that the United States has ever had. So, okay, they're all flawed, okay? Let's get this on the record here. They're all flawed founders. And if you look back there for perfection or if you look back for them to meet all of our standards of racial justice and sexual equality, you're gonna be disappointed. But you're, but this is the greatest, you know, all, all uh, apologies to, uh, the, who is the guy that wrote The Greatest Generation? Um, Tom Brokaw. Brokaw. But this is the greatest political generation in American history. Um, and I, I can hide behind the observation of Henry Adams, who writing in the Grant administration said that if you look at the list of American presidents from beginning up to now, you've got to believe that Darwin got it exactly backwards. <laughs> well, so uh, who was the one indispensable founding father? Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton, Madison. Yeah, if the, one person hadn't existed, what would, would we be different? I have a lot invested in, uh, in making the case that they function so well because they are a collective and that there is a kind of built-in checks and balances in the personalities, the idiosyncrasies, and the ideologies of the respective founders. If you just have Hamilton, we're headed towards dictatorship. If you just have Washington, if you just have Jefferson, we're leading, we're moving towards anarchy. So, but there was one who was the founding as father of them all. And they would have all agreed about this. If you asked Franklin, you asked, all, you know, the Hamilton, Madison, um, Adams, they would all agree that Washington was the greatest. And because of his judgment, he wasn't as smart as many of them. Hamilton was the smartest. He would have got the highest grades on the LSATs. Right. Uh, Jefferson was the best read. Madison was the most politically agile. Adams was the most thoughtful about government, I think. Um, so each of them had particular strengths, but they all said Washington was indispensable. And, and he was. And the most indispensable thing he ever did, which is what marks him as so different from all other revolutionary leaders, is he walked away from power twice. After that is to say, he was indispensable because he made himself disposable. Think about revolutionary leaders in history. Julius Caesar doesn't do it, Oliver Cromwell doesn't do it, Napoleon doesn't do it, Stalin doesn't do it, Mao doesn't do it, Castro doesn't, still hasn't done it. 
Um, um, the only one who's done it is um, the South African leader. He walked away. And um, Washington walked away. The most important act of power he ever committed was to surrender power. So he did it after the Revolutionary War. He surprised everybody by, by turning in his sword, in effect, and going back to Mount Vernon. And then after he was president, after two terms, he could have served a third term or for or life. He chose after two terms to go back. That's what you're referring to. Yes. So let me ask this. The premise of your, let's get to the premise of this book. Ah, this book. This is great. I want you to understand. Right. Okay. Yes. So <laughs> we have a Revolutionary War. 1776, we finally win the war. 1783, we sign the agreement, Treaty of Paris. Everybody goes back to the respective states. Um, did the people who were then operating under the Articles Confederation expect it to be one country, or was it 13, really in effect, separate countries? Explain the Articles of Confederation. When did that come about? See, for most Americans, the 1780s is a kind of dead zone. Like, somehow, we win, we declare independence in 76 and win this war, which is a big deal against the greatest army and navy in the world. And then after a while, there's this interregnum, and then we come together again to declare nationhood in 1787 and ratification of the following year. And Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, gives credence to a set of assumptions which are historically untenable and inaccurate. The first clause of the first sentence of the most famous speech in American history says, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. No, they didn't. They brought forth a confederation of sovereign states provisionally united to win the war and then go their separate ways, which is precisely what they did. The resolution for independence, July 2nd, which is always the date that Adams thought would, should be the national anniversary, July 2nd, 1776, proposal that these American colonies are and have every right to be independent states. Think about the arguments we've been hurling against Parliament for 10 years. Sovereignty rests, rests with the respective colonial legislatures. The last thing the Americans want to do is create a federal government separate from the states, because that looks like a domestic version of parliament. So they don't want to do that. So that the assumption that most people have that there is this seamless natural evolution from 76 to 87, from independence to nationhood, that doesn't work. It's not true. That means you've got to figure out a way to explain how you get from independence to nationhood if, in fact, most people don't want it to happen. Right, so you have... And it, they don't. If you took a poll, you know, this, most people are born, live out their lives, and die within a 28-mile radius. And there is no, I know this is a surprise to some young people, there is no internet. <laughs> well, they can't communicate. And so I'm saying that American history is headed in a particular direction after the war. It's headed towards the Europeanization of the North American continent. It's headed towards an EU rather than a United States. It's headed towards a confederation model. And somebody changes the direction in which American history is headed. There's a reason that Lincoln has to falsify history in order to win the Civil War, or to justify it, because he claims that the war, that the Union precedes the states. And the, see, the Confederacy has a pretty good argument Namely, the Confederacy claims that the, the, war of the, the Civil War is really the second American Revolution um, to win back their own sovereignty. Um, it is, in the end, a war about slavery. I'm on that side with the Confederate flag, so don't get me wrong about this. Anyway, we're not a nation in 76. Patrick Henry at the Virginia Ratifying Convention says, well, suppose, and he opposes the Constitution, he says, suppose we do this, and the Virginia delegates in the Senate and in the House all vote against a tax bill. And it passes. Then we've been taxed without our consent. Because he doesn't think that he's an American. He thinks he's a Virginian. 
Jefferson thought that way too in 76. He says, I want to get out of Philadelphia. I don't want to write this document. I want to go back to my country. His country is Virginia. So that somehow we've got to explain how history is headed in one direction and it changes and it heads in a national direction. Okay. So what happens is during the um, Revolutionary War, the colonies are governed by the Articles of Confederation, which had been put together to kind of govern them through the war. Right. The war ends, everybody goes back to their respective states, they just wash their hands of any kind of uh, unity, let's say, and the Articles of Confederation do not allow each of the, do not allow the Congress, there was a Congress then under the Articles, to tax unless they You can unanimous. tax, you can unanimous. tax, except the states don't have to pay. It's and a voluntary thing. So, Would you like to pay $100,000? Oh, okay, sorry about that. That's the way it is. So we're running a $40 million debt, increasing, you know, someone said there's two modern miracles. One is Einstein's theory of relativity, the other is compound interest. And, um, and so, like, it's, go it's going to be $77 million by the time you get to 1787. We are a banana republic. With no we bananas. cannot pay our debts, okay? There's no way we can do it. And that's one of the major okay. flaws. So, uh, the Congress is not able to tax. There's no standing army. And then, um, recognizing this, a few people say this isn't working. Two of those people were James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. And how did they come together to kind of create something that would be different? What did they do in Annapolis, for example? Annapolis, yeah, right down the road here. In 1786, there is a recognition that interstate commerce needs to be coordinated among the states. See, like New York is charging tariffs to New Jersey and Rhode Island. Virginia it wants to be able to pay money to, to expand the Potomac for internal navigation, and she wants to get Maryland and uh, Pennsylvania to contribute. Anyway, so they have this convention in Annapolis with the limited purpose of trying to get some kind of agreement for interstate commerce among the states. It fails. Only five states show up. Actually, three others come, but it's too late. Everybody's gone away by the time they get there. <laughs> Hamilton and Madison have met each other before. They worked in the Confederation Congress together. Hamilton from New York, Madison from Virginia, and they are part of this. Now, get this. This is Madison, this is, excuse me, Hamiltonian version of leadership. It's really great. It's dangerous as the Dickens, but it's really great. They have just failed to even get a quorum. So Hamilton writes a draft to be sent back to the Confederation Congress. All of us here agree that, <laughs> that we need to convene a, con a, a convent, we need to call a convention for the second well, Tuesday in May to address the larger question of rights and responsibilities within this large collection of states that provides energy for a federal government. Right. It would be as if a journeyman boxer had just been knocked out and had declared he was going to challenge the heavyweight champion of the world. I mean, and so that's audacious form of leadership on Hamilton's part. What happens is that the triggers and makes more plausible of such a convention is two things. One, in my section of Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, there's this uprising of farmers called Shays Rebellion. Now, there really is only like 1,800 guys who really don't want to pay their mortgage, okay? And they want to vent that against Boston. Boston's always been treating Western Mass as a colony. They still right. treat us that way. And, um, <laughs> I mean, their whole water supply is out with us, okay? Right. And, um, but, um, this is, this is, it's not manipulated because a lot of the people really think it's a serious crisis. Um, Madison thinks it's part of a conspiracy by the British coming down from Canada to take over New England. So it's blown out of proportion. And this creates an atmosphere where the need for reform in the articles is, is becomes plausible again.
So the, the other thing that happens is they persuade Washington to join the team. So they send this to, a big deal. They send this to Congress yeah. con under the Confedera uh, Articles of Confederation, and the Congress says, "Okay, let's have a convention." Why did they do that? They were kind of slitting their own throat. Why would they have agreed to allow a convention? To because start? the convention is not intended to replace the Articles. The convention is charged with reforming okay. the Articles. Okay. Right. What they think they probably need to do is something to make possible coordinated foreign policy. Massachusetts has its own foreign policy. Okay. Adams is over there as our ambassador to the court of St. James says, nobody believes that I can represent anybody because you don't have any central government for me to represent. Right. And so, yes, we clearly need to do something to reform the articles. Right. There won't be a consensus about how much reform there should be, but yes, reform we want to do. This is where it, what happens becomes close to a coup d'etat. The people who want to have the convention get together in the spring, Washington, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay, and they say, we will only settle for not a revision of the Articles, but for a total replacement of the Articles, which is a violation of their instructions. Okay? Washington says, I will not come out of retirement unless you promise me that we go for broke. If we don't go for broke, it's not worth it. I'm, risk I'm risking my reputation and my legacy here, and I don't want to risk it for, for small potatoes. And they promise him. And then Madison is the one who organizes the plans, the Virginia plan, which sets the agenda for Okay. the Philadelphia Convention. Right. So Washington agrees, importuned by Madison and Hamilton, to come and lend his prestige. They get to, to Philadelphia. People finally show up. They have various times 55 or so delegates. They decide to have secrecy. Nobody's supposed to know what's going on. Can you imagine? We, this is the rule. Yes. Total secrecy. No press coverage allowed whatsoever. Uh, nobody can communicate with anybody outside the convention about what's occurred. Can't write letters or anything like that, much less Twitter people. Or, and um, and, uh, and um, so the, one of the reasons that a second convention can never work because it, it can never, you know, it can do what this one did. Fifty-five white males get together and decide the future of the country. So they're meeting. And you can't talk to them, by the way, while, while this is occurring. So they're in Philadelphia for, they didn't know how long it was going to take, but it started in May and went to a rough sub September, roughly. Yes. So they're there for roughly 90 days. Uh, Madison and the Virginia delegation have a plan to change the government. What's the essence of that plan? So Madison's plan, the Virginia plan, calls for the creation of a three-pronged government. Notice the Articles isn't really a government. The Articles is a peace pact, a kind of League of Nations with a Congress that, repre that represents each state. Every state has one vote. What he says, we take the model that each state has pretty much independently adopted of an executive branch, a bicameral legislature, there's some states that have single house legislatures, and an independent judiciary. That's the model for a national government, okay? okay? Madison wants there to be an uh, article that allows for the executive branch to veto all state legislation. And he also wants both houses of the Congress to be based on representation, political, excuse me, population, okay. rather than be state-based. He loses both arguments. Uh, his notion of an executive veto is dead on arrival. The great compromise of the convention is the so-called Connecticut Compromise by states in the Senate, by population in the House. Hamilton, Madison, uh, and Washington all regard that as a huge defeat. And so what they get is a compromise. One of the reasons that I find myself so insistently arguing that a, judiciary, a judicial philosophy based on original intent is impossible, is that nobody got what they wanted. That is to say that the intentions of both sides, those opposing the Constitution and those supporting it, uh, had to be compromised. 
And the result is a hybrid system that's part confederation, part nation. We don't become a nation in 1787. We become, we have the foundation for a national government. As one historian so nicely put it, it's like the federal government they created is like a roof without walls. We still aren't a nation. I don't think we become a nation until the Civil War. Um, but nationalism right. starts to rear its head after the War of 1812. Um, but they create a federal structure which is partially based on states and partially federal. Right. And where that line is drawn, aha, we can all disagree in peace about that. So they, they reach an agreement after three months. Yep. They then have to send this agreement back to somebody to approve it. They could send it back to the Confederate, Confederation Congress to approve it. They could send it to state conventions. What did they decide about the approval process? In the actual document itself, it specifies how it can be approved. It cannot just be approved by the Confederation Congress or by the state legislatures. It must be approved by elected ratifying conventions elected in each state. That's their way of saying it has to go back to the people. It has to be ratified by some freely elected group solely there to vote on this. So the 13 states create, uh, Rhode Island is late to this game. He's, they, they're intractable and, and you know, there's always been, Rhode Island's this place where Massachusetts sends witches and Quakers and crazy people. <laughs> and, um, and they're all down there in 1787 and they won't even cooperate. They whatsoever. had nobody at the uh, Constitutional Convention? They don't, yeah, right. They boy boycott the convention and they boycott the ratification yeah. process. But um, the ratification needs but, nine states, is that right? Aha. See, a court, it's another illegality, another little coup here. According to the articles, for the articles to be modified, it requires a unanimous vote. They say, and they say this in the document, this will be approved if nine states ratify. Who gave them authority to do that? Nobody. But they know that if they make it unanimous, it'll never pass because Ryan Island is going to vote against everything. And so they make it nine votes. And the whole strategy for ratification, and not enough Americans know about this, this, uh, the, this is real. It's get to nine. Like, there's a sequence of states that are going to have their meetings, okay? And they're going to vote. 1,638 delegates in 13 states are going to meet, and they're going to argue about this till the day. But if we can get to nine, there's certain states it's really going to be tough. Rhode Island, New York, Virginia is really going to be tough because you've got Patrick Henry on the other side. But if we can get to nine, it's over. Well, and they'll have to come in. The other states will have to come in. So they're trying to get to nine, and Virginia looks like it's going to be the ninth state. And that's where the best debate at the At the end of the Constitutional Convention, three delegates, two from Virginia and one from Massachusetts, refused to sign because there's no Bill of Rights. Right. Is that a big issue in the ratification process? Yeah, it's the single biggest critique, uh, namely that the document should have had some kind of Bill of Rights. Every state convention includes some version of this. and so. The question is, well, why? And Madison, throughout the ratification process, by the way, Madison, Hamilton, Jay write these things called the Federalist Papers, okay? Which are probably the most important political. And there are a total of uh, 85 of them? 85. Madison wrote uh, 29. Um, Hamilton wrote 51. And Jay wrote the others. Jay got hit in the head by a rock in the beginning of this. He was defending this hospital that was being attacked by a mob in New York because they claimed that they were doing, you know, they were doing work on cadavers, which they, people thought was a bad thing. Anyway, he got hit in the head and, and had a, so he couldn't cooperate. But Jay, by the way, if you're an investor in American statesmen, go long on John Jay. His reputation is going to go up, not just because I've written about him favorably here, but because his papers are just being published and all of a sudden we see a luminous presence, a serenity, an incredible correspondence with his wife, uh, Sarah, who's a gorgeous gal, um, and he is a formidable figure. When Washington becomes president, and he, 
he's, he goes to Jay, to John Jay, and he says, what do you want to do? Any office in the cabinet you want is yours. Everybody thinks he's going to go to Hamilton first for Treasury. No. Going to go to Jefferson first for State. No. He goes to Jay. Jay is that prominent of a figure. Um, and he didn't take any position. He decides he wants to be head of the Supreme Court. Right. So, big, big mistake. But he, anyway. So, all right. So the ratification occurs. Yes. And um, the let, me th let me throw one thing in here. Most people in the ratification co uh, conventions would have preferred to say, we don't like the articles and we like them to be changed, but we don't really like the full changes of the Constitution. That option is not available to them. Why? It should be. Madison controls this. This is part of their, he says, it, you can make recommended amendments, but they cannot be mandatory. You either vote this up or down, yes to the Constitution or no. That's the only choice you got. If you vote it down, we're back to the Articles. Now, you can recommend amendments, and if you do, and this is where the Bill of Rights is going to get made, we'll take them under consideration, but you cannot make them mandatory. Right. So the, the Constitution is ratified. Uh, the ninth state was New Hampshire, and actually Virginia came next. That's right. But when they were ratified, there was no requirement of a Bill of Rights. Why did Madison feel that in the first Congress he should actually go ahead and draft a Bill of Rights? Great question. This is like the setup question. And um, <laughs> the Bill of Rights, we like to think of the Bill of Rights as American Magna Carta. And it, partly it's because it comes at the end, it's a separate legal codicil, if you will, about defined rights. And there's a lot of people, Jefferson included, thinks the Bill of Rights is more important than the, the document called the Constitution. And a lot of Americans think that way now, too. That's not the way Madison thought about it. Madison thought, we've got to add a Bill of Rights to take some of the recommended amendments that have been proposed by six states. There are about 128 amendments. A lot of them are repetitious. He takes the 128 amendments. Now, there's some of those amendments. All six states that make amendments make the following recommendation in one form or another. We don't want to pay taxes, and we don't want to have to pay. <laughs> Okay? He says, deep six that one. <laughs> we're we're going to just edit that right out. But, for example, four of the states say, we are really scared of a standing army. And we need some legal protection from the possibility of that tyrannical presence. Listen up. That's where you get the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is an attempt to assure the voters in those states that wanted this, that American national defense would be in the hand of militia rather than in the hand of a professional federal army. The right to bear arms is a derivative right from service in the militia. That's the way the courts have always seen it until Citizens United, no, excuse me, D.C. versus Heller, right. 2008. So, when, all right, so in the first Congress, Madison uh, goes back and forth with the, House, with the Senate. They draft these amendments. Twelve amendments are agreed to by the House and the Senate. They send 12 amendments to the states. How come there's only 10 amendments in the Bill of Rights? Two of them don't make the ratification process in the states. It's a real tough process. It's a supermajority process in both houses of Congress and a supermajority um, in, the, in the states. So it's really hard to ratify an amendment. I mean, ask, you know, let's, it's really tough. It's almost impossible to get a constitutional amendment now. So there are 10 of them that are approved, and ultimately another one did get approved later. But um, today, let me ask you two final questions before we have questions from uh, the guests here. Uh, one, if you, um, what, what happened to the other founding fathers in this process? Uh, um, where is Adams? Where is Jefferson? And where is Benjamin Franklin? Uh, Benjamin Franklin's there in Philadelphia. He's, he's dying, and he's carried on a uh, sedan by six very husky prisoners from the Philadelphia jail into every session. He's one of the few delegates that makes every session. 
Most of the things he says has to be spoken by his fellow delegate from Pennsylvania, James Wilson. But he's there, and he gives a very eloquent, elegiac statement at the end which, uh, about what he thinks the, the Constitution means. Adams is in London, he's cooling his heels as the first American ambassador to the court of St. James. Think about this. Suppose Luther were appointed ambassador to the Vatican, okay? <laughs> That's what it's like for Adams to be in London, okay? And Jefferson is blissfully present in Paris um, in, at this time as American ambassador um, there. Um, that's probably lucky because if Jefferson were here, based on everything he says later, he would have probably cited he would have opposed the Constitution. He thought a Constitution should last 20 years and then redo them every 20 that's, years. Yeah, part of it is, you know, can you imagine Madison just spent two and a half years trying to get this thing through, through and the first thing Jefferson tells us, you know, by the way, all Constitutions should go out of, out of existence every 20 years. So if you could have dinner with any one founding father, uh, who would it be? And what one question would you want to ask that one founding father? Uh, this is my favorite founding father is Adams. It's not just because I've been, become a Massachusetts man. It's because he's the most garrulous and he's the most outspoken. He'll tell me the truth. He'll tell me what he's really thinking and what he really feels towards the other. Um, and the question him. I would ask him now is, John, now that you're sitting up in heaven, what do you really think of Trump? <laughs> okay. So, questions. We have time now. We have some time for questions. Here, go ahead. Um, you talked about the process of uh, this whole thing was kind of unauthorized. Uh, you said that only nine of the 13 had to ratify. What did they think would happen to the remaining four states? Did they think they'd do their own thing? Uh, you, you said Rhode Island or whatever never actually joined. What, why they eventually, they eventually, all the states have ratification process happen. Um, they presumed correctly <clears throat> that the pressure to join would be inexorable. Now, if Virginia hadn't ratified, even if nine states had, that would have caused a major problem. I don't know whether the Union could have functioned without Virginia. Virginia is the largest state, both in land, in economy, and in population. Um, but they assume that if you get to nine, the pressure will build. New York was three to one opposed to ratification. George Clinton controlled the press and the, and the delegates there. There was no way to win a debate in New York for, the only way that New York comes in is kicking and screaming because they have no choice. By the way, Hamilton, who's part of the New York debate, he says, if you don't come in, I'm gonna get New York City to secede and join Connecticut. <laughs> one, one of the problems was also that there were three delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Two of them were Clinton supporters. They were against the Constitution uh, the changes, and so Hamilton had no influence really in the because every state convention. has one vote, he'd be outvoted every time. Yeah. Right. Okay. Next question over here. Hi. You mentioned in, in your book that that uh, the genius of the Constitution is uh, it's the ability to change it and to and to deal with a, with the different issues of different times. Do you think the founders would be uh, shocked by the fact that today, like you just said, we 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 find it very hard to pass amendments to the Constitution and have to go through the Supreme Court for, every, for settling every issue, and more often in one justice in, in that Supreme Court? Wow, you know, that's a loaded question. I, <clears throat> I do think there is an agreement among most sensible observers in this country and outside that the current Congress of the United States is dysfunctional. I think that I think it's also pretty much of a plutocracy. I don't think the founders can be blamed for this. One way you could blame them, and this is where you're sort of blaming Madison, although Madison didn't, is that we have, we don't have a parliamentary system. That is to say, you can have a president elected and you can have another party control both houses of Congress, as occurs now. That makes for divided government. And there is a belief in checks and balances that seems to be somewhat a stumbling block. I would argue 
that the major reasons for the dysfunction aren't themselves a function of the structure of the Constitution. It's what, by and large, we have done to it up here in the 20th and 21st century. I think the filibuster is probably unconstitutional, especially the form in which it's taken. And the Haffert or Hassert Rood rule, whereby the Speaker of the House need not report a bill if his, if his um, caucus, even though it's a minority of the full, doesn't want it. That means you've got these places to block legislation that are automatic. Um, and in this partisan atmosphere, that makes it very difficult to get anything done. I think that's a function, and that doesn't m mention the fact that the average congressman spends the bulk of his or her time raising money okay. for himself or herself or for the party. Next you, question. You just touched on this, um, but maybe you can go into a little more detail, but what would the founders think about the current state of the United States Senate? Not so much the popular, popular election of senators, but this rule which says essentially if one senator raises his or her hand, it now takes 60 votes to to vote on any item of substance. There were differences of opinion back then about the, the role of the Senate, but I think that certainly Madison would think that the way in which the filibuster has evolved in the direction you just described is a violation of what he intended and that it should be put before the Supreme Court and rendered, if possible, if the judgment is in keeping with his intent, in this case, um, on that form, a, 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 a silent filibuster is unconstitutional. Okay, question? Um, thank you very much, Professor. I've read a lot of your books. And page 185, you mentioned reference in your new book to the Tea Party. Ah. Yes. And basically with that in mind and these other questions, when I think of the U.S. Constitution, uh, I also think of the age and the enlightenment. And do you think basically that we need a new style or new change in the government right now? I uh, don't think we'd be able to get, anyway. Um, you mentioned a pl plutocracy today, a minute ago. Yeah. Uh, you also referred to the, con uh, uh, the Confederation as banana republics. Um, so Not now, but then, yes. Well, I'm maybe today. To, um, your, your question is what? With today's lobbyists and the president's executive orders, uh, do we need to do something in this country relative to the Constitution and the way it's structured? In 30 seconds. Uh. <laughs> I'll, I'm going to pick something out of your question to answer and then give it. The, the larger answer is we're only 320 million frontal lobotomies from success in that regard. Um, but um, the Tea Party's real origins are not with the Tea Party of 70, of, of the revolution, as much as the anti-federalist movement. Remember, the original Tea Party is protesting the fact that it doesn't have any rights because Parliament is taxing them without their consent because they don't have representatives in Parliament, okay? The anti-federalists say, we're being taxed without our consent even though we have representatives. And the reasoning is that they don't trust big government. They don't trust any large federal government far from their own borders and their own neighborhoods. And that's the real political origin of the Tea Party mentality, which is a constant strain in American history. It comes up here and there. It takes on different names at different times. And now in the 21st century, it's calling itself the Tea Party. The government is them. The government is not us. Okay? Now, you know, you get into all kinds of conflict now. You know, I don't want the federal government to take away my, you know, how can the federal government take away my Medicare? <laughs> we, uh, yeah, and, and you get into it. But if you're looking for the origins, it's back there in the Anti-Federalist. Last world. question. We're out of time. So one last question. Thanks. Professor, at the beginning of the talk, you had said that the class of leaders we're discussing today came from a great political crisis. What type of crisis will it take the country to see that class of leadership or leaders of that type ever again? 
uh, impossible to answer that question. I know this young woman, she was a former student of mine. And um, was she a good this student? is not a plan. I would say, I would say there's only one crisis that has the potential to generate that kind of leadership, global warming. That climate change is a threat to the survival of the planet that will grow until, well, long since I'm, and when New Orleans is underwater and Miami's underwater, and droughts are killing millions of people in Africa, and the weather is the first item on the news every night, we will have the energy to think about um, doing things differently. In that sense, global warming could be a godsend. It could wake us up. Dr. Ellis, I want to thank you very much for an extraordinary uh, presentation. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.